In this series, we've gone back to basics, looking at the fundamental rules that makes rooms work or not. And those rules are there for you to use at home, for you to get the interior design scheme you've always wanted, saving you a lot of hassle, a lot of worry, and ultimately a lot of money. It's human instinct. Whenever something goes wrong, the first thing we do is scuttle back to our burrows. In a busy, stressful life full of responsibilities, the home is the only place that we have where we can exercise complete control. This program is all about the things that make a house a home. In just about every room, there's an extremely fine line between chaos and order. And it's that final lap of interior design, that moment when you move your stuff back into the room, the stuff you use every day, or the stuff that means something to you, that's when it always seems to go wrong. One of the first things you need to consider is where to put your furniture. In our design laboratory here, in a secret and very remote location, we've recreated the average British room. Small, rather unlovely, isn't it? But it's in here that I'm going to prove basic points such as how does a room arranged like this affect our mood compared to a room arranged like this? Come on, you two. Right, coffee table out. A designer will always think about the layout of furniture from the outset. Nothing is left to chance. Now, doesn't that look better? And that is because humans feel happier when surrounded by symmetry. But more of that later. The second aspect to consider is display. I'm going to show you a few hard and fast golden rules that makes the art of showing off your bits and bobs and your nicks and knacks as successful and painless as possible. As you know by now, in this series we apply the rules of design to the kind of houses the majority of us actually live in. British houses are considerably smaller than other European countries. In fact, only Finland and Germany have smaller abodes. It's little wonder then that so many of our houses are overflowing with our much valued possessions. This entire house is a, well, treasure trove. It's simply overflowing with toys, personal keepsakes, and things picked up from around the world. And as for the bedroom... Come and join me in a moment of well-earned self-satisfaction. OK. I know that our homes have cluttered, untidy corners, but nothing like this room, or, in fact, this house. To be fair, it's not so much that this space is untidy, it's the fact that it's actually been very, very badly edited. There's some very nice things in here, but there's also a lot of things that, OK, I know they exist, I know they're necessary for day-to-day -day living, like grey socks and pants, but they don't really need to be there in your face the whole time. Crucial thing with a space like this is obviously to think in terms of storage and organising the things that you need, the things that you want, but crucially, I think, the things that you want to look at. Don't forget the bedrooms always have a fixed viewpoint. You're on the bed the whole time, so you're looking in one direction. It's not like any other space where you're wandering around and you see things from different angles. A bed, you're a captive audience. So it's very important to work out the axis, where you're looking. That is the focus, that's the focal point, and you need something there that's going to really delight the eye. Suntan lotion, dirty hairbrush, dusty old trinket box, somebody's ex-teddy bear. I don't think my eyes are satisfied at this moment. This is nice over here. Look, 
It's an altar to the ancient goddess of laundry, and it is a crying shame. Underneath these fleeces, these T-shirts, all of these bits and pieces, there's an absolutely beautiful set of shelves. I don't, might have come from a locker room or something. You've got these rather roughly carved in Roman numerals. If that was organised in such a way that your eye was looking at that, not at this, well, its existence is vindicated. Everything in this room is fighting for attention, which is a shame. It's a bedroom. It should be somewhere that's serene, should be somewhere that's relaxing. But at the moment, you can't separate the wheat from the chaff. And yet you look around and there's some really very, very nice objects in here. There's an ethnic embroidery over there, there's a lovely Mexican mirror over there, but it's just all totally covered by this miasma of stuff. What's interesting is that we do actually get used to the environment that we live in. So, for example, Americans come to Britain and they say, oh, your rooms, they're so small, they're so cluttered. They find the way we live rather intense, overstimulating. On the other hand, the British come to the American houses and the room seems so large and so empty. It's a little like living in a warehouse. It's a little disquieting because we're not used to having that much space in our environments. So we adapt to the level of stimulation that we're in. The people who live here have clearly grown accustomed to living with clutter, but being used to it doesn't make it nice. I want to create a room that is more pleasing to the eye. The most common mistake people make with bedrooms is that we tend to cram too many functions into them so that we fulfill none of them very well. Dressing and storage mean bulky, often ugly pieces of furniture that clutter the space. Anyone that feels that they can get rid of everything they own and start again, create a minimalist controlled space with the right vase here and the right magazine rack there, is, is lying to themselves. Our lives are full of experiences and the things we surround ourselves with are testimony to those experiences. So here, there's bits and pieces that were picked up on travel, on holiday. The fact that there's a child in the family. All of these things come together to make a life. That should be respected, but that doesn't mean it needs to look rubbish. So where do you start? When you walk into a room for the first time, what do you notice first? I mean, a fireplace, a window. These are immovable architectural elements. They're there to stay. They are focal points around which you will have to plan the arrangement of your furniture. It is astonishing how many people buy furniture on impulse without really thinking about the overall design. So how do you decide the best layout for a room? Let's go back to basics. Let's imagine this clear space is the first time home of Mr and Mrs John. And excitingly, today they're moving in. So their first job is to arrange their furniture to suit the room and suit the way they want to use it. left to their own devices, completely unguided, it's going to be interesting to see what our Mr and Mrs John do. Yeah, you see, that's interesting. We're making a big fuss about where to put the television. It's interesting, this is exactly what I'd expect. People just go into a room and move the furniture around in a very, very willy-nilly fashion. Um, and I bet you, by the time that's finished, that will actually be changed again in a couple of months as some kind of furniture therapy. Not, I think, to get it right, but simply just as a change for change's sake. They should have thought about it beforehand. Congratulations, gentlemen. There we go. Thank Probably you. Light refreshment. Marvellous, marvellous. Hello. Now, obviously, Mr and Mrs John are a slightly unconventional couple, although they have made the most basic, and I'm afraid to say the most conventional mistake in terms of laying out the furniture. When a designer starts to look at a scheme for a room, they will always consider exactly where the furniture goes before starting, because it affects everything, rather than as Mr and Mrs John have done, just kind of work it out as you go along off the cuff on the hoof. So if this is wrong, 
Then, what's right? Not bad, actually nudging perfect, but why? First of all, let's explain why Mr. and Miss... Oh, thank you, Mr. John. Oh, and Mrs. John as well. Let's explain why Mr. and Mrs. John have a Union Jack right in the middle of their living room. It's made up of two sorts of lines, good lines and naughty lines. The right angle straight lines that connect the focal points like the fireplace and the window are good lines. The diagonal lines going from corner to corner are very, very naughty lines. And unfortunately, Mr. and Mrs. John decided to arrange all of their furniture around the naughty lines. I, however, have used the straight right-angled lines to create a near perfectly symmetrical arrangement I think works perfectly. As a rule, we carbon-based lifeforms tend to prefer buildings and rooms that are specifically designed to be symmetrical. But why is that? Symmetry is biologically important. If you've got a symmetrical face, it means it's got a pretty good genetic basis, that there aren't a lot of imperfections, so to speak, in the genetic coding. And it is said that particularly girls' faces are most beautiful when they're symmetrical because that girl is a good bet to have babies from, quite honestly, you know, that's what it boils down to. So that symmetry has that sort of biological advantage. Again, if you're recognising things around you, something which is symmetrical is probably something living. It's probably a plant or an animal. Of course, animals and plants are mostly symmetrical and it's an immediate way of recognising something that's living from something that isn't in general. Faces are probably the most important environmental stimulus we have. Recognising expressions, recognising people, and a huge amount of our brain, a huge amount of the architecture of our brain is designed to process faces. So it may be that this like of symmetry in faces spreads out into an enjoyment of symmetry in other things, in objects as well, that it's simply a generalisation from faces. My plans for the bedroom at number 16 will make the most of the architectural symmetry of the house. In particular, this pair of north-facing windows, which at the moment are lost under layers of knick-knacks. Let's face it, I just need to clear this clutter. Hello. Quite fancy this room now. It's amazing what changes can be affected with the simplest of interior design techniques like tidying up. You see, without all that eye-catching distraction of all those bits and pieces, suddenly exposed, in its full glory, a pair of symmetrically balanced windows. And that will establish this concept of framework for the room. In the hands of a stonkingly brilliant architect like Charles Rennie Mackintosh, the furniture and finishing touches of houses like this were considered from the very outset. Now, I know I have already mentioned the importance of vocal points, but they are important. The eye is constantly searching for stimulation, and focal points provide a point of interest for the eye to settle on and explore. Bedrooms have two views. They are rooms with two halves. The first is what you see when you're lying in bed. Here, a Macintosh chair is perfectly framed with symmetrical wardrobes either side. The view of the bed is equally symmetrical with embroidered hangings and mosaic niches either side to draw your eye. But what Macintosh did that was so clever is he created a back reference to old-fashioned romantic four-poster beds, but he did it architecturally with masonry and plaster, simulating the effect of draped fabric. The atmosphere of this room is tranquil, it's serene, it's balanced, it's ordered. It's perfect for a bedroom. In the quest for a sense of order in the bedroom at number 16, I've designed cupboards that will conceal a multitude of sins. Remember, out of sight is out of mind. Oh, and take note of the clever storage above the door. The layout of the furniture in here is completely dictated by one thing, this, the storage. 
I could not use storage on any other wall without it fouling the windows. Originally, like most Western bedrooms, I would imagine the bed was supposed to go there, which meant that half of it was shielded as you opened the door, because that, once upon a time, was a chimney breast. But it's a different story in the East. According to Feng Shui, the ancient art of health, wealth, happiness and furniture arrangement, your bed should always be placed so that you can see people as they come into the room. Also, your head must always be supported by a wall, so no beds just left in the middle of the room then. And another thing, your feet should never be sticking in the direction of a door. It's all very complicated, it's all very oriental and, you know, it's down to whatever floats your boat, really. Or in this case, your junk. Traditionally, the fireplace was always the focal point around which you would arrange your furniture. But nowadays, this often competes with the television for centre stage. When television first became widely available, nobody tried to conceal the fact they had one. In fact, quite the reverse. These days, I don't think that people think about televisions enough. They either just say, OK, fine, I'm going to celebrate that great big technological monolith in the corner, or they hide it away in a chintzy little cabinet. I really believe that a television can be incorporated into a modern design scheme. But first of all, you have to work out where you're going to put it. So, back to Mr and Mrs John. Why did they get this room so wrong? They committed the first mistake, so many of us do it, putting the television in the corner of the room. Which means that the sofas end up in the opposite corner of the room. And look, connected by this fantastically naughty diagonal line. What I did was move the television from there to there. And see, that is on the straight, right-angled line that connects it right up to the principal focal point of the room, the fireplace. Because, in the 21st century, as far as we're concerned, the most important focal point of any sitting room is the television. So, OK, but isn't that going to be uncomfortable? No, let me show you. Look, our grandparents sat on sofas like this, all very perched. We sit on sofas like this. See, Mr John has got a perfect view of the match, whereas Mrs John can have a lovely view of the fireplace. And as if all that wasn't good enough, when they've got friends round, the perfect conversational arrangement where they can talk about things like what it's like being a John. So, let's look at a good example of this in the real world. This is an extremely good example of a balanced living room, a room where everything is considered right from the very beginning. Even the last minute details are part of the scheme. The colour scheme itself is taken from the collection of black and white photographs, which of course are rarely black and white, but a series of neutrals. So hence the stripes, hence the browns, hence the topes. What I find fascinating is the slight subversion of the rule of good and naughty lines. We've got a straightforward axis that goes right the way through the windows out to the river. But then so that that view can be enjoyed at the same time as television. Television's been squeezed in on a technically speaking slightly naughty diagonal line in the corner. But it works because on the other side it's balanced by a black sofa. So few people actually realise that a black television screen is something that can be used to the benefit of a space, as long as it's considered along with all the elements. And in fact, this room also shows that modern technology, televisions, hi-fis, in my case wind-up gramophones, can and should be incorporated into a scheme. In fact, the column speakers either side of the window frame the view. And what a view. So it's about balance, it's about order, it's about conceiving and considering the room as a whole, even down to the finishing touches. OK, it's now time for a bit of detail. It's time to think about the art of display. Remember, carefully coordinated arrangements of objects can add character and individuality to a room. Ooh, la, 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 la. 
Let's start with displays within the principal room in any house. The sitting room. First thing you need to consider is eye line. The arrangement above the fireplace in here is designed to catch your eye when you walk in. However, the arrangement also needs to work from your seated eye line. I think the arrangement above this fireplace does its job perfectly, but what is the secret of its success? Is there perhaps science at work here? The objective is quite straightforward, to increase the height of the fireplace by one third to balance the height of the ceiling, and also to give the eye something pleasing to catch on in a standing viewpoint. So why are these lines here? This box at the top is the missing third third of the fireplace. But why a third? The ancient Greeks were very specific about this. They believed that perfection was measured in thirds. And it still colours our judgement today. So, the tall candlesticks, either side, define the outside edges of the third third, vertically. This triangle here is made up of two lines, both of which are two-thirds long, so they are the same length as the height of the fireplace, and that has created the perfect apex from which to hang a round mirror. Right, okay. Fine, all looking quite good, if a little bit altery. I've got to knock the edge off that church feeling, and two smaller candlesticks in the same finish as the outer candlesticks, only a different shape. Place there and there. Do it perfectly. Notice, however, how they happen at exactly the point that the pyramid line comes across the horizontal line of the third third. In the middle, a vase of flowers, which has now created an inverted pyramid from that point down to that point and back up again, which perfectly balances the pyramid defined by the mirror. Two pyramids happening at the same time, both of them totally balanced. It's a geometrical cat's cradle, which means that no one element spins off on its own or becomes too dominant. Then, two small black frame pictures for no other reason than the fact I'm a designer. There are other design rules relating to scale and proportion that go way back in time. The ancient Romans and Greeks were so sure that humans had an innate sense of design, they devised a set of rules that drew inspiration from nature. In architecture, we have a kind of empathy from our own bodies. In other words, if you've got a column, uh, if it's very thin, it doesn't sort of look man enough for the job of holding up the cornice or whatever it is above it. And if it's ever so thick, it's kind of clumsy, unnecessary, that imaginatively you sort of place yourself in the parts of the building like a caryatid, you know, which is a human column. And I think there is something in that, that we empathise with shapes around us. We kind of think of columns as like people holding a thing up. And this sort of empathy idea based on the human form is, I think, an interesting idea. The golden section was a key principle in architecture, relating the proportion of structures to those of the ideal human body. This treasure of geometry has intrigued and inspired architects, designers and artists for centuries. Believe it or not, these rules can be applied to everyday objects in your front room. Even when faced with a relatively straightforward task like where to hang this wonderful painting. Obviously there it doesn't work above that small insignificant piece of furniture, the effect is top heavy. Whereas that, now, it's balanced, it's harmonious, it's really quite Leonardo. So what are the cardinal rules that govern displaying your objects? There's actually one big granddaddy rule in charge of them all, which I suppose makes it the papal rule, which is you need to establish a working relationship between the objects that you're displaying. Scale is important when displaying objects. Generally, an object needs to be framed by its surroundings, so big objects will look better in big rooms.
Groups of three are easy to arrange and easy on the eye. Can you look at this? Four flower arrangements and it just doesn't work. Three flower arrangements or five flower arrangements and it just looks that little bit more naturalistic. Always odd numbers, never even. Many of us have lots of small objects, often with sentimental value. But what do you do with them? They're so tiny, how do you display them? And here, the solution has been to form a collection around them. Not necessarily things that are the same, but things that look good together. Back to the mantelpiece. Now, I always like to see the mantel shelf itself as a seesaw. You imagine that is a plank and there's a fulcrum in the middle, so the whole thing can go either way. This is a very orderly, very considered arrangement with the same kind of objects grouped either side of the central point. So the whole thing balances. When Mies van der Rohe said less is more, he wasn't actually referring to display, but the same rule does apply. Keep it simple. Back at number 16, work is complete. This room was crying out for help, screaming for balance and harmony. Remember, we need domestic spaces that allow us to recharge and relax. I've chosen the draped fabric hanging above the bed because it will serve as the principal focal point when you enter the room. I wanted the view from the bed to be as calm and uncluttered as possible. Think of those moments before you go to sleep winding down and reflecting on the day. We can now appreciate the beauty of the shelving and by selecting the wheat from the chaff, objects you didn't notice before have been given space to breathe. Now, I don't want you to start thinking that this is a triumph of storage over substance. It's not as easy as taking all the clutter and simply dumping it into the new fitted wardrobes, although of course that does help. This room is about careful editing. It's about maximizing the things that delight the eye and minimizing the things that don't. There's a lot of symmetry in here, which is great. It's very tranquil. But where we can't achieve symmetry, we have at least created balance. And if nothing else, this is about order out of chaos. To find out more about how to impose balance and harmony within your home, log on to our website at www.bbc.co.uk stroke homes. As you may have gathered, no element of interior design can be seen in isolation. They're all interdependent. Next week, I'll show you how to blend various aspects of design to match your personality.